OK, I'm assuming everyone can see that. Um, welcome, everybody, to part one of 12,000 years. Um, I, as Andy has said, am Lee Bray, and I am one of the Dartmoor, Archeolo Dartmoor National Park archaeology team. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is it's a very quick gallop through, as the title suggests, 12,000 years, although it will immediately become apparent that it, actually I'm lying there. It's a bit more than 12,000 years in, in some ways. Um, so first things first, I need to address a couple of questions, uh, the first of which is what area am I talking about? Well, this is Dartmoor. I, uh, it's a granite upland, part of the southwestern uh, Batholith, it's called, uh, and all the uplands in the southwest from Dartmoor westward are part of the same mass of granite, geologically speaking. They all poke out on the surface um, uh, along the length of the peninsula, even right down to the Scilly Isles. Today, the, the climate is, is cool and wet, and the uplands and parts of it are defined as by sort of moorland vegetation. So we have uh, bogs and heather and, and um, malinia grass, uh, very few trees on, on that upland, surrounded by uh, lowlands, which consist of enclosed farmland where the farming is a bit more intensive. But Dartmoor's not always been that way. This is just one iteration of what Dartmoor has been, which we will see over the over the course of the talk, I hope which will run uh, tonight will run to the early bronze age i'll be finishing at the end of the early bronze age be basically because well there's a nice finale in that and uh, and it's a convenient one in the course of this talk it, it's about halfway through it so so the second definition is what is archaeology and that's a, a fairly good potted uh, definition the study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and analysis of artifacts and other physical remains what that actually means is that we study pretty much everything that has anything to do with people and, and, and is old. <laughs> so um, that can include artifacts like pottery or flint tools, uh, metal objects, uh, the earthwork remains of different sites, upstanding and ruined buildings, uh, entire landscapes even, if you like. And that's particularly the case on Dartmoor, where we have entire preserved landscapes that still, that still survive. Um, even documents, and for the historians among you, I'm going to offend you now and say either that uh, history is a subset of archaeological information, or as it, according to the to Facebook the other day, a nice meme I saw said that history is really just the celebrity gossip of archaeology. I'm not serious, honestly. Um, so those are the definitions out of the way. Uh, our first question, really, I guess, is is when did humans first encounter what we call Dartmoor? Um, and for that, we have to go way back beyond the um, 12,000 years of the title to the to the Paleolithic period, which uh, is an enormous period um, divided into several parts, uh, starting about half a million years ago. And up the lower in the middle uh, Paleolithic, at least, are from 500,000 to 60,000 years ago. And they are the sort of the preserve uh, in this part of the world of, of this chap down here, Neanderthal. I'm not going to say Neanderthal man because that's not good. And Neanderthal people. Um, it's not an, a period we have any evidence for really on Dartmoor, with the exception of a single stone axe. Now, that isn't it in the top left corner. That's just a, an image I culled from somewhere to give you some idea of what sort of thing we're talking about. Um, it's an axe that was found, I think, in the 30s uh, near where the, well, I think Hunterton Warren on southern Dartmoor is where it, where it was found. But we can't really put too much weight on it because we don't know how it got to the area. We have no context for it. It was a surface find, so it could have been dropped at any time. So we can't really rely on it on, as, um, as early evidence of people on Dartmoor in this enormous span. Uh, if we, so big question mark there. Um, if we move a little bit further forward in time to the end, the, the, the upper Paleolithic, the last sort of 40 odd thousand, 60,000 years. This is the period when we have the famous cave paintings in southeastern, southwestern France and northern Spain. Uh, it's a period when most of Britain and a lot of northern Europe are covered in ice sheets. And Dartmoor isn't covered in it. Well, not covered in an ice sheet that we know of or, or, or confident about. What we have is a landscape much like that one. It's a tundra in, environment. So cold with brief summers and long cold wind winters. We do know, however, that people are here. Human beings are here um, 
in the southwest. Uh, we have the evidence from Kent's Cavern for a start. This is one of the earliest human fossils from um, northern Europe for roughly four. They keep changing the dates on it, but it's about 40,000 BC uh, from uh, Kent's Cavern and is a piece of human jawbone. It's a period of time, as I've just sort of mentioned, when he, modern human beings, biologically modern human beings like us, Homo sapiens sapiens, are around and in northern Europe. Um, slowly over time replacing Neanderthals, although I am for the Paleolithic specialists among you skating over this incredibly quickly. So apolog apologies there um, for what is actually a really complicated and ever changing picture. Um, so what I've just said is probably out of date, I'd imagine by now. So I should also mention, because I'm going to mention it a bit later, that at this time we don't know, but there is some debate in geographical circles over whether or not Dartmoor was home to uh, some small ice caps. Um, there are some landforms that suggest this in different parts of Dartmoor and some other evidence that we uncovered that I'll come, I'll come to in, in time today. Um, so at the end of the Ice Age, which sort of defines the end of the, the Paleolithic, if you like, we have rapid climatic warming going on across globally, really. Um, across uh, and across northern Europe. Uh, and the effect of that really is a changing landscape, changing climate. We see trees, which previously in, in a tundra environment hadn't really existed, spreading from southern Europe where they, where, where they sort of had a, a refuge, if you like, northward across the landscape quite quickly in archaeological terms. And with them came bands of people. This is a period we call the, the Mesolithic period. We had the preceding Paleolithic, which means Old Stone Age, uh, the Mesolithic period is Middle Stone Age. It's an enormous span of time. It lasts from about 12,000 years ago, the 12,000 years of the title, up to about 6,000 years ago. So about half the period we're talking about is Mesolithic. Um, and at this time, these bands of people are living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They are it's a mobile lifestyle. They lack permanent settlement. We don't see anything like that in the archaeological record. Uh, any structures that are found, and we haven't found any on Dartmoor, I'm talking about more widely in Britain and the southwest, are, are rare and they're very slight. Uh, the most common evidence we see are scatters of their flint tools and hearths from campfires sometimes. Now, uh, we do have those on Dartmoor. We do have that sort of evidence, but no one yet has really studied it. We have plenty of flint scatters that we know of, and we have plenty of flint tools and waste that is in, in collections in various parts of the southwest. Um, I'm really pleased that um, in conjunction with Leicester University, we're, we're going to be having a PhD student starting next year. who's going to hopefully start unravelling some of this. So I'm quite excited about that because we contrast quite strongly there with, with Exmoor National Park where this period has been extensively studied um, and, and they know an awful lot about what was going on in that area at this time. Um, not that I'm competitive at all. Um, but some of the evidence, perhaps the most abundant evidence we do have comes from what we call paleoecology. So studying the environment, the wider environment in the past. And that, that evidence comes from uh, uh, peat bogs, some of which were already in existence, not many, but some were in existence by this period. Um, the way this works is that peat has really amazing preservative qualities for um, for organic material. So what we have, a, we can date the peat at a particular depth and at that depth we can then look at things like pollen, uh, plant remains, insects, um, um, fungal spores, all kinds of different things are preserved in, in the peat that allow us to study what the environment was like and draw some conclusions. So we know that it was a, a Dartmoor was a largely wooded environment at this point with the evidence we have, probably a little bit similar to the photo in the top left corner or, or for those of you who know it, to Wisman's Wood or somewhere like that. Very similar sort of environment that people were moving through and living in. We also know that at this period of time, within those peat sequences, we see large amounts of microscopic charcoal in peaks. And the way that's been interpreted is that that is people already starting, even at this early period, to interfere with their environment. The interpretation, and it is just an interpretation, is that people are starting to selectively burn 
vegetation in areas, a bit like the swaling we do today, and for very similar reasons, they're trying to attract game so it becomes more predictable and they can hunt it more effectively. Um, for any of you who saw the recent Surviving the Stone Age uh, few programs on the telly, you saw how difficult they found it trying, trying to track game down. So um, you can imagine why Mesolithic people might have done this. Before I go on, I'd like to just draw attention to a particular little irksome thing I have, a little bee in my bonnet, and that's about our reconstruction drawings. To me, these are reconstruction drawings I've borrowed from Exmoor National Park, um, but these are typical of the images we see. Because we, our artists tend to just try to fit, uh, fit their conceptions to the information they have, the archaeological record, we don't really imagine around the edges very much. So what happens is, particularly in prehistory, our reconstructions always look like these people have come from a 1970s Glastonbury festival. They're always bearded, including the women, and they just look brown all the time. It, it annoys me. I always think, particularly for the Mesolithic, we should be looking towards cultures like Na Native Americans it, um, and the, how colourful they were. They were. How many, all those body piercings they had, the funny haircuts they had. I suspect the Mesolithic was rather like that, rather than the what, pictures we see here. So take these reconstructions with a pinch of salt. Um, now, what we see next in the sequence happens about 6,000 years ago, conventionally around 4,000 BC. Um, and it's really a real paradigm shift in the way people interact with, their, with the environment around them. Uh, this is the Neolithic period, the New Stone Age, and it's all, it's defined by the adoption of agriculture. Now, that sounds a bit abrupt, doesn't it? Um, it sounds like people woke up one morning and said, I oh, know, let's go and plant some seeds or let's go and get these animals and keep them in the shed. But um, that isn't the case. Uh, it's a bit more blurred than that. And there's a lot of academic debate, a lot of ink's been spilt, probably a lot of blood has been spilled over what exactly this means. What is agriculture? Is that burning of the forest edges that we were talking about earlier? That's manipulating the environment. That's controlling animals to an extent. Is that agriculture? Probably not in most definitions, but it it sort of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. We talk de de debate these um, these uh, definitions, if you like, about what exactly people were doing. Um, but what the Neolithic, what this point in time does show us, or roughly this point in time, is that people's conceptions of the environment and the world around them changed quite drastically. And the reason we know that is because suddenly in the archaeological record, we have obvious signs of people adapting their environment and marking it, if you like. They're building monuments. Uh, some of those you can see in the, in the slide I've just shown you, uh, I've got up now. Um, we see a whole range of monuments appear at this time. Uh, and we'll talk about the early Neolithic first, the first thousand years of it. So from 4000 BC to 3000 BC, a really rather very remote period of time. But we do have these surviving uh, monuments from this period. The ones I'm showing on the screen are examples of tombs from Dartmoor. Um, these are not peculiar to Dartmoor. We find these types of tombs all along the Western seaboard. Uh, the portal Spinster's Rock, very famous portal dolmen, it's a class of monument we think is a tomb. Uh, some human remains have been found in them elsewhere in the country, uh, but the evidence is really quite slight. So we, for now, we classify them as tombs, but they were probably a little bit more than that. Uh, and Spinster's Rock is thought to have been surrounded by a whole host of later monuments. That it was part of a complex of monuments, if you like, but very little of that survives now. It's in enclosed farmland. Another example, another type of tomb we are see, we see are the chambered tombs. Uh, these are basically small mounds with a small chamber inside, as the name suggests, where the remains of the dead were placed. Often, and this is a theme again we'll see through prehistory, those those um, tombs are not those chambers are, are open. You can get into them because people seem to want to come back and interact with the dead in different ways. Uh, a picture I haven't got here, we do, but we do have them on Dartmoor, are long barrows. These are long earthen mounds, again with chambers inside them in which burials were placed. Um, these in elsewhere in the country, um, up in Wiltshire, for example, some of these have been found to contain large numbers of people. It seems that the, the burial rite was a communal one, uh, and but people were interacting with the dead. They were removing the bones, doing something with them and putting them back, organising them in different ways. Uh, in the in the in the tomb, so very different to the way we approach the dead today. Um, 
Another early Neolithic monument, which we see on Dartmoor, are tour enclosures. These are really a Cornish phenomenon, but we do have outliers, two in particular, on Western Dartmoor uh, at White Tor and the Dewarstone. These are um, simply defined as stone banks or walls that surround and incorporate outcrops, granite outcrops at the tours, hence the name a tour enclosure. Um, they are a new phenomenon really in the Neolithic is the idea of enclosing space, which is something that again occurs throughout prehistory for various reasons, many of which we don't understand. Um, we don't really understand the purpose of these. This is White Tor I'm showing you on the screen. You can see the Ordnance Survey data showing you the enclosure there. On the left is an image of, of LIDAR, a LIDAR survey. LIDAR is, is a survey technique which involves firing hundreds of thousands of pulses of laser light at the ground from an aircraft which flies backwards and forwards across the ground and measuring the response time, how long each pulse takes to get back to the sensor. Um, now, what that gives you is this textured view of the ground that you can see on the left, and it shows up very nicely all the lumps and bumps. Its great advantage is it, it can sort of see through the vegetation and just gives you the ground surface, or you can you can process it to, to show you that. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here. You can see very clearly on, I don't have a pointer, I can't point in any way, but you can see very clearly in the centre of that image, the enclosure on top of White Tor, which has two banks and large cairns in it, which I'll return to a bit later. Um, these are quite mysterious. We don't we don't know what reason they were what what the purpose behind them were was. But some of the latest work we have suggests that they may have these places may have a significant history. We've got to remember that we as archaeologists divide the time up into nice neat chunks uh, of a thousand years, two thousand years, six thousand years. But time isn't experienced in that way uh, by by these people. What what actually happens is periods that have proceeded will influence what's going on in the present. So it could be that these locations had significance to, say, Mesolithic period people. They were important to them, and that importance continued into the Neolithic period, and which was a period when people started to mark the landscape. So that's what they were doing here, uh, enclosing this place that was for some reason important. It might be that they are um, gathering places where people met to, to enjoy festivals, to um, uh, exchange animals, exchange marriage partners, um, that sort of thing, exchange news. Uh, and so they became important and perhaps invested with other meanings as time went on. Um, it could be that these had some defensive function. One of the Cornish examples at Calm Bray does appear to have been attacked at some point. The excavations there in the 1970s and 80s showed that it recovered an awful lot of arrowheads clustered in different places in the interior. So possibly they are the scenes of some violence at some some sort of upheaval uh, at some point but we don't know um, i'm going to be saying that a lot here we don't know um, i'm afraid this is prehistory um uh, so oh i think i've got yeah there's slides of what white tour actually looks like on the ground you can see on the bottom image you can see these two uh enclosing banks going off to the west with a fantastic view of cornwall there you can see the cairn i mentioned um and pointed to on the lidar it's an enormous thing uh, a couple of meters high and t at least 10 across probably more so very enormous very large um, um monument um so one thing to remember in the uh, in the neolithic is that Although we see all these monuments of the landscape, we don't really see anything of everyday life. We don't see where people are living. Uh, we don't have any structures that might be houses. So a common interpretation is that um, it might be that people had a nomadic lifestyle. They were following their herds and flocks, maybe hunting, maybe a lifestyle that wasn't too different to what had gone on in the Mesolithic before. So it's it's something to think about and something we would like to find out more about. So. I don't want to give the impression here that, you know, monuments were different types of monuments were defined by different periods necessarily. It's actually a lot messier than that. And I'm sort of simplifying it. Different types of monuments come in and out at different times and they progress and they evolve and are linked to each other. And that happens in different parts of the country at different times as well. So it's quite a complicated picture, but we're just looking at Dartmoor mostly. And I want you to look at Stone Rose next. They're a bit of a problem. Um, not least because like most monuments in prehistory, we don't really understand what they're about. What they consist of 
are, as the name suggests, rows of upright stones. They can be a, a double rows like the ones you see in the picture from Asakum uh, and, and one of the Merivale ones. They, there can be several on one site. They may not all trend in the same direction. There are actually three or four, four or five. I can't remember how many at Merivale um, that you won't see unless you're really looking for them. And those are at right angles almost to the main rows. So very complicated picture, very strange monuments. They're often associated with cairns is worth notice, noting as well. We don't really understand them. Again, Dartmoor has 60 percent of the country's stone rows and the longest one on Stormore at three and a half kilometres long. So you could spend an entire career studying these things. We don't really understand their date. We conventionally put them at this sort of period, somewhere around between 3000 and 1500 BC, usually. However, recent work at Cut Hill on northern Dartmoor, right in the middle of northern Dartmoor, it's one of the most, re most remote spots you can get to on Dartmoor, has what appears to be a recumbent, i.e. all the stones are lying down, stone row that disappears off under the peat. Now, some of the peat underneath those stones was dated, um, two samples, I think, uh, and return dates of 3500 BC, which suggests by that time um, those stones were lying down. So that's a thousand years almost earlier than we thought. So whether that is a stone row and whether those dates are real, is very much up for debate at the moment, but it has kind of made us question where these um, where the stone rows fit into the into the um, into the whole debate about monuments. We have a lot of ideas surrounding what they were for. Are they avenues for procession? Are they metaphors for birth, life and death? Because maybe you processed from one end representing death to the cairn at the other end, which um, represent sorry, the beginning represents birth, obviously. And then you go to the cairn at the end, which represents death. That's an idea. Um, are they aligned on features in the landscape that are no longer there? Are they aligned on astronomical phenomena? We're not sure. A recent idea that I really like uh, talks about pre-literate societies and how those societies, all of them that we know of, have very sophisticated technologies and methods for remembering the, inf the huge amounts of information they have to remember to survive. Things like animal behaviour, what the environment does in different circumstances, who's related to who. Those things all have to be remembered and are remembered by stories and chants and poems and all, all those and dances even. So maybe these monuments are part of that process. It's it's hard to prove. So uh, but it's an interesting idea and one I quite like. Um, so. Those were stone rows. Now we'll go on to. Um, another type famous type of monument stone circles uh, again very difficult to date we think we're a bit more confident with these that they date to somewhere around in the middle of the third millennium i should say actually that the late neolithic just to give you a bit of context starts in 3000 bc that's roughly the time that we're seeing the first activity at stonehenge it's slightly earlier than that but it's roughly that time it's also around the same time that in the Near East writing is emerging um, and developing in places like Egypt and, um, and Mesopotamia. So just to give you a little bit of context, we're nowhere near at that stage of sophistication here, but we are building some fantastic monuments like uh, like these stone circles uh, at. I can't remember the name of the top one and I haven't labelled it. That's not very good, is it? But there's Skorl down on the bottom left. Um, and the, th the thing about those two, they're examples of most of Dartmoor stone circles. In fact, most of the country stone circles, they have been restored and messed about with by subsequent generations. So we don't know if how well what we see now reflects what was there in the past. Um, that's not the case with Sitterford on the right there, which is um, which I hope you can see. That's a photograph taken from the top of a pole and it shows Sitterford Tor in the background and the, the stones of the circle outlined uh, or laying out nicely in the foreground. Um, the thing about Sitterford is it was only discovered in 2008 and had been buried in the peat ever since it um, it, it was abandoned. Um, so it has been untouched as far as we know by subsequent people, um, at least to, to a large extent. We've done a little bit of excavation there because originally we thought maybe these stones are arranged like the petals of a flower because they've been knocked over deliberately like that so that 
there's some sort of ritual going on there. But we dated the peat from underneath four of those stones in total that show that two of them were lying down by 2000 BC, suggesting that the stone circle was out of use by then. Uh, and two of the others were down in 1500 BC and 800 BC. So it looks like a monument that was abandoned and fell over gradually, um, possibly because it's in the middle of a peat bog and the peat was encroaching. We, we don't know the reason for abandonment, but that's as good a reason as any, I think. Um, and I met, said I'd come back to the, the possibility of ice caps on Dartmoor, and that's uh, certainly the case here because we added unintentionally, we added the evidence for that by uh, digging the trenches, you can see. And in the base of those trenches, uh, the subsoil underneath the peat and underneath the, the remnant of the soil that preceded the peat uh, is uh, a material that doesn't look like the growing, the, the sandy, rotten granite you see on Dartmoor. Instead, it was very fine material and looked rather like glacial till, the material you find under glaciers. So that's a debate that we've contributed to un unintentionally, and it looks like increasingly plausible that there were little ice caps on Dartmoor during the last ice age. OK, uh, our final type of, well, that's not the final one, but nearly the final one type of monument are these, which are very prominent across Dartmoor's hilltops. Uh, these are, are cairns. Uh, most of the ones on Dartmoor are cairns. They're built of stone. That's all that means. Uh, but some are barrows and are built of earth, uh, but they are effectively the same sort of monument. They date probably to the centuries around 2000 BC. However, uh, it's not that simple. Remember that cairn at, um, at, at the tour enclosure at White Tor? We don't know how old that is. If it's original and part of the tour enclosure, that puts it at least a thousand years earlier than these. So it may be that some cairns or barrows are a lot earlier than the ones we, we, we see. Uh, not many have been excavated to modern standards on, on Dartmoor. Um, only in the last 50 years, only three, a cluster of small ring cairns on, which are now underneath a, a clay dump at Shaw, on Shaw Moor uh, were, were excavated. And they proved to date, I think, to later than 2000 BC from memory. So you can see these monuments are being built several centuries on either side of the 2000 BC mark which is in, in the early Bronze Age. Um, what they're for, they're often assumed to be funerary monuments, uh, i.e. they contain a burial, um, and that is often the case elsewhere, but not on, uh, and has been on Dartmoor. I'll come to that in a moment. But also, they don't always contain a burial. In fact, many of them don't uh, on Dartmoor. We know of some that have been excavated in earlier by earlier archaeologists that, that didn't have burials in them. Um, they might have a pit with charcoal in it, uh, which allows us to date them, but but that's all. It's also worth remembering that with these, these monuments in particular, that what we see is the latest iteration of these monuments. It could be that, <coughs> so like buildings today, for example, they had a very different form when they were first built, and that's been added to and adapted over hundreds of years as, as their use has changed over time, so that what we see now is very different to what started. Uh, what started in that location. So that's worth remembering when, when we're looking at these things. Um, uh, what else? Where do we go from there? Oh, that's it. Yeah, I did say that um, not all of these have burials in them, but some of them do. Possibly the most famous one is that the Hameldown bar Barrow um, on top of Hameldown above Widdicombe. Uh, this was excavated in, I think, the, either the 1860s or the 1870s by a chap called Spence Bates, who, um, that's his surname, double-barreled surname. He was uh, a dentist from Plymouth, uh, one of our earlier archaeologists, and, and quite a good one, really, considering the time period he was operating, and he, a pioneer, really. He even left us, at this early date, he left us with a plan of the monument, which you can see at the bottom there, and a section through the trench he dug through it. It's a large barrow, on, on, uh, as I say, quite, you know, 40, 50 feet in diameter in, in his, uh, his measurements. It contained a burial, a very rich burial uh, with uh, amazing grave goods. So you can see those in the top left. Spence Bates commissioned these uh, wonderful watercolours um, of, of the find, which was a bronze dagger uh, with uh, an amber pommel and gold pins, very similar in style to the ones that were being made at that time. This is roughly just after 2000 BC in the area of Stonehenge and some of the rich barrow burials there. So 
you're talking about people possibly with connections with that area. Uh, certainly stylistically, they were exchanging ideas uh, or even exchanging the objects. Unfortunately, thank heavens that Spence Bait did take these records and later photographs were taken. You can see on the bottom right because the dagger was housed in the Plymouth Athenaeum and which was destroyed in the war. So uh, the dagger went with that. I'm afraid that's all we now have of it, which is a shame for Dartmoor and well, and archaeology generally, but particularly for Dartmoor. So um, the final sort of monument, which I'm going to end on, um, is uh, are the kissed graves. We have 70 odd of these on Dartmoor. They are effectively a stone box of varying sizes. Uh, the one at Merivale, which you may have seen, is enormous with a huge capstone on it uh, that contained a burial, either usually a cremation from what we can gather. But it's possible that some like the Merivale one may have had inhumation burials in them. So an actual body. Uh, some have associated features like the Wigford Down example at the top. Um, I'm not sure that is Wigford Down. That's not Wigford Down. That's Belliver. That's Lakehead Hill. I don't know how that label's got there. I, I think that should have been on the label on something else. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so those are examples and you see these, they are found across the Southwest, uh, why, more widely than just the Southwest, but in the Southwest in particular. Ours on Dartmoor are a little different because the vast majority of them are aligned on a Northwest to Southeast axis, which suggests that there was some meaning on that. Excuse me a second. So, um, it suggests also perhaps that Dartmoor was slightly different in some aspects of its culture to the areas that surrounded um, surrounded it further west in Cornwall, for example, or further east in Devon or, or north in North Devon. We see similar things uh, with the stone monuments of Exmoor, which are tend to be very small. They're tiny little stones where everywhere else has really quite large stones. So maybe we're seeing a signs that there were different, slightly different cultures. I don't say radically different, but people doing the same sorts of things, but with slightly different ideas across the region at that time. Um, we, we're not sure. Most of the kiss graves on Dartmoor have yielded not much more than a, a, a flake of flint or two or some charcoal. And that's been the case for the vast, well, for almost all of them. Two of them did yield human hair. Um, but even in the 19th century, the archaeologists who found that said, we think what this is, is folkloric practice of, of a modern date. So witchcraft, if you like, uh, for what reason? We don't know whether it was, it was somebody trying to gain blessings or cast a curse. Who knows? But it, it's it's a nice, colourful story. Um, the unprepossessing example of a kiss down in the right is the famous White Horse Hill kissed on one of the highest points of Dartmoor. This was uh, what I want to finish with really, uh, because we're now approaching uh, the end of the early Bronze Age, or, the, or we are in the early Bronze Age, but this one in particular dates to the roughly the end of the early Bronze Age. Um, this was a, a kiss that was noticed in the late 1990s. Um, it was eroding from the side of a peat hag that you can see it set in there. Uh, it was attempts were made to shore it up, which lasted for about 10 years, maybe a little bit more. But in 2011, it became very clear that it was eroding away and it needed to be excavated in order to record it, uh, it because it was going to disappear. Now, that excavation proceeded in a fairly normal fashion. Uh, nobody was expecting anything untoward until uh, during the excavation. I am told I wasn't there. This was before my time. Uh, in the bottom left, you can see a bead that may even be the actual bead that suddenly rolled out of the as they were trying to excavate it. And that's when everything changed. Uh, you can see the excavation ongoing there in the top left, <coughs> but it became increasingly apparent that the peat with those preservative qualities I mentioned had conserved the entire contents of a kissed grave, uh, including all the organic grave goods that had been in, in the grave when it when it was when it was made. Um, now, that, as is so typical in archaeology, this happened late on a Friday afternoon. Uh, the kiss grave was open. Nobody caught anything of that because they weren't expecting anything. Uh, but now they had a real situation on their hands because the weather was close, going to close in over the weekend and that would have destroyed the contents of the grave. So apparently there were panics and uh, trying to get hold of the military to help them 
do something, trying to get hold of farmers uh, to help them do something, the farmers all being at a show in Oakhampton, which I always think probably means they're in the pub. Um, and nobody was available to help get this grave off or get the contents of this grave off the moor and out of the weather. So what happened was they had to wrap the whole thing in cellophane, take the lid off, wrap the whole box in cellophane, and take it off in the wheelbarrow you can see in the bottom right. Apparently it was incredibly heavy. They're in a remote spot on, on Dartmoor um, and nobody could handle the wheelbarrow for more than about 10 yards. So eventually they did get it off the moor in a panic and they took it to Chippenham, um, which is a, a conservation lab there where it was excavated bit by bit in the laboratory and proved an entire treasure trove uh, of, of goodies really for, for us archaeologists, things we just don't see and many things which are unique. Uh, they date from roughly, from memory, about 1750 BC, uh, the 18th century BC. Um, they included this wonderful basket, which is made of lime bast. It's the bottom left, and you can see it being worked on at the top. Uh, lime bast with cow hair decoration. Uh, there was a necklace over 200 beads, which can, mostly were shale and, uh, which is shale from Dorset and baked clay but also the amber you can see in that photograph and in the middle, a, a stud of tin, which is possibly a, a smoking gun for actual tin exploitation happening this early on Dartmoor. The bottom right is a composite piece of nettle fabric, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, and leather with a, with a decorative fringe, I hope you can see there in the middle. Uh, that's a unique object. We don't really know what it is because it doesn't survive fully, but it looks like it might be a belt or a sash of some sort. Um, there was this top left, there was this cow hair bracelet, uh, also with tin stubs, studs in it. I forget how many off the top of my head, but we think it's a bracelet or an armlet. It's a strip anyway. Incredibly complicated uh, pattern of, um, of cow hair work there, which you can see in, in that photograph. My favourites probably are in the bottom left. These are just some fairly simple, made of spindle wood, uh, simple. They are the earliest example of um, wood turning, I th I, certainly in the country, possibly in Northern Europe, I can't remember um, off the top of my head, by about 500 years. So we have lathes being used at this time, uh, simple pole lathes, I'm sure, but um, a bit of a mystery as to what they are, but the best interpretation at the moment is that they are librettes for, as the, bot, as, as the right hand picture suggests uh, and illustrates, for putting in your ears when they're stretched or your lips or some other part of your body that is stretched and have, has a hole in it. I like them because refer, for referring back to that, um, my tirade about um, reconstruction drawings, they are giving us an insight into how these people addressed or expressed their identities. Uh, and that's wonderful. That's something we just don't see very often in the past. And we end up with those bland, brown, bearded reconstruction drawings. This is a fantastic light into that sort of mental world of these uh, cultural world that these people had. Um, I should say that there was a, a cremation burial within all this material as well. Uh, the bones are, are gracile and slight, which it means we're interpreting this as a young woman. I think the age is somewhere around her early 20s. Uh, but one of the interesting things is that much work has been done on, or some work has been done on cremation burials and how much material is left after the, a body is burnt. Uh, in this case, there isn't enough there. So possibly we're seeing again those weird and wonderful, to our eyes, burial rituals of people sharing bits of the body out or doing something with them before that what's left goes into, into the ground and into a grave. Um, there's an interesting idea with the burial itself. Um, the radiocarbon dates that come back from the, the burial suggest that the, the bones themselves may be up to a century older than the rest of the grave goods, um, possibly suggesting that that body's been around a bit like granny granny's ashes on the mantelpiece, if you like. Uh, and eventually it's become appropriate to put her in the ground with all 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 these grave goods. Um, the whole thing was wrapped in the top left, uh, this this fur, which um, took a while to identify. But eventually I think they found an expert in northern Germany 
who identified it. It was held together with this copper alloy pin as well. Um, but eventually they found out it was one of these, a brown bear. I like this because we often talk about the environment in the past and we could perhaps if we were churlish say this was uh, possibly a traded item and it might have been. But I like to think that this is a bear that was wandering about on Dartmoor or somewhere in the southwest at some point. And it just is a wonderful illustration of just how different the environment was that these people lived in. Um, so the white horse seal is, is, a, is a find of just totally international importance. You, you can't stress enough just how important it is, just even on an international stage um, to give us that little window into life at the end of the Bronze Age, at, um, at the end of the early Bronze Age, I should say. And this is a, a lovely reconstruction image, one of my favourites, even though the people are still bearded and brown, um, of the funeral happening, of it being put into the ground and imagining, if you like, um, which shows the environment, which was, we know from the peat cores, uh, very similar to the way the top of Whitehorse Hill is today. It was, it was, a, was a peat bog, even by this point. Uh, and she's being laid to rest in that kissed. Um, so she is on the cusp, really. Uh, her death and her burial is on the cusp of a very big change in Dartmoor's archaeology, which is which I'll talk about next time when I talk about the Middle Bronze Age. Uh, and with that, I'll be quiet and unshare my screen so that I can see that see the rest of you. I hope you're all still there. Uh, we'll see. OK, Excellent. thank you.